Tonight, I'm particularly honoured to welcome you to an event that could only be possible through multilateral collaboration. I first would like to acknowledge Barbara Osher. She is a passionate Swede who has generously endowed the Department of Scandinavian Studies with the Barbara Osher Endowed Professorship in Swedish Studies. Please give a round of applause for this generous gift. I'd also like to thank the Alumni Association whose events enrich our greater community, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies, the Office of the Vice Provost of Global Studies, the Walker Ames Fund, Svea, whose flag is flying here this evening, the Stellar Holdings Group, Scandinavian Airlines, UW Hillel. It's particularly appropriate for our global university to host this evening's distinguished visiting lecturer at this moment in time. With our institutional and community connections to Scandinavia, our scholarly exchanges to students um, from this room and to those who go back and forth from here to Scandinavia. We are uniquely situated as an institution in the field of Hans Blix studies. For our campus, Blix is a norm entrepreneur seeking to set the agenda in world peacekeeping and peacemaking. How appropriate that he's here during the week of the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize. I now invite Carol Kessler from Battelle to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Good evening. It is truly my honor to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Blix. Dr. Blix was born in Uppsala, Sweden, and studied at the University of Uppsala at Columbia and at Cambridge Universities, where he received his PhD. In 1959, he became a Doctor of Laws at Stockholm University, and in 1960, he was appointed Associate Professor in International Law. He also has an honorary director, doctorate from the Moscow State University and is a recipient of the Henry DeWolf Smith Award. From 1963 to 1976, Dr. Blix was head of department at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Sweden and served as legal advisor on international law. In 1976, he became the Under Secretary of State at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in charge of international development cooperation. He was then appointed Minister for Foreign Affairs in October 1978. From 1961 to 1981, he was a member of Sweden's delegation to the United Nations General Assembly, and from 1962 to 78, a member of the Swedish delegation to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Perhaps his most important career to that time was he served as Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency from 1981 to 1997. In 1998, I had the pleasure to meet Dr. Blix when he became the Chairman of the Government Oversight Committee for the Chernobyl Sarcophagus Project. It was a very different role for him and one in which he still, nine years later, remains the chair. He then moved on to take the appointment as chairman of the UN Monitoring, Verification, and Inspection Commission at the UN starting in January 2000 and stayed in that position till June 30th, 2003. After that, Dr. Blix took on chairmanship of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission, and this was again in 2003. This commission was funded by the Swedish government, but was fully independent. The commission's mandate was to seek to identify desirable and achievable directions for international cooperation on realistic proposals aimed at the greatest possible reduction of the dangers of weapons of mass destruction. These were to include both short-term 
and long-term approaches and aim at preventing the further spread of weapons as well as at their reduction and elimination. The scope of the investigation was to be comprehensive, covering nuclear, biological, chemical, and radiological weapons, the means of delivering them, and also possible links between these issues and terrorists. The report of the commission, which I hope you've all had a chance to look at, is entitled Weapons of Terror, and was presented to the UN General, Secretary General on June 1, 2006. It presents proposals for reducing as far as possible the danger of weapons of mass destruction, both nuclear, biological, chemical, and radiological. The commissioners with Dr. Blix consisted of a group of esteemed international security experts from all corners of the world. I'd like to quote to you from the cover letter to the document to give you some context for where Dr. Blix and the commission came from. And I quote, some of the current stagnation in global arms control and disarmament forums is a result of a paralyzing requirement of consensus combined with an outdated system of block politics. However, a more important reason is that the nuclear weapons states no longer seem to take their commitment to nuclear disarmament seriously, even though this was an essential part of the nonproliferation bargain, both at the birth of the nonproliferation treaty and when it was indefinitely extended in 1995. And then just an excerpt from the final report, probably one of the hardest and most important issues we face in the weapons of mass destruction issue. And that is weapons of mass destruction cannot be uninvented, but they can be outlawed as biological and chemical weapons already have been and their use made unthinkable. Compliance, verification and enforcement rules can with the requisite will be effectively applied. And with that will, even the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons is not beyond the world's reach. I'd like to note that the University of Washington is doing its part in partnership with my institution, Pacific Northwest National Lab, to develop the next generation of nonproliferation experts. The Jackson School of International Studies and the Pacific Northwest National Lab have created the Institute for Global and Regional Security Studies. This institute has now six courses in nonproliferation and global security studies for UW students. The institute also employs two Russian professors who teach nonproliferation, as you can imagine, from quite a different point of view. And also, it's developing a course with Fudan University in China on export controls and nonproliferation. This is truly a universal problem. I now bring to you Dr. Hans Blix, one of the world's truly great statesmen. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And perhaps I <clears throat> should begin by apologizing to the important uh, Department of Scandinavian Studies that has brought me here that I am not addressing you in Swedish. But I suspect there may be one or two of you who doesn't understand it. Uh, so I will stick to English. I'm very happy to be in Seattle on the beautiful west coast of the United States. And Seeing part of this landscape, I can very well understand why so many of my compatriots and compatriots from the Nordic countries settled over here. I'm also very happy to be the guest of the University of Washington. A famous American once said to me that he respects people who search for the truth and he feels a little concerned about people who have the truth. Well, I think universities are and should be places where you search for the truth, where you always have a critical mind 
and all this open for new observations and new possibilities. And in some ways also inspectors at the international level should have the same spirit. Look with criticism, critical mind at what you are seeing and not just taking the surface. Now it has been said that diplomats are people who think twice before saying nothing. <laughs> <clears throat> but you need not worry, I'm retired. <laughs> so I intend to speak to you very candidly. Today, there is global warming in the world's physical atmosphere, but a global cooling in the world's political atmosphere. One cause that the two worrisome developments have in common is the world's enormous demand for and use of gas and oil. Competition about access to oil and gas resources is bad for security. Someone said rightly that if Iraq's main product had been kumquats, there would have been no Gulf War in 1991 and no war in 2003. Indeed, many tensions in the Middle East and in Central Asia are today linked to the access to oil and gas. The burning of oil and gas and coal as well and the emissions of carbon dioxide are bad for the environment. And I confess that for the long term, I'm as worried about global warming as I'm worried today about the threat from the weapons of mass destruction. However, the subject of my talk is the sad reality that the end of the Cold War was not followed by a bold and systematic peace building, and that traditional balance of power politics are back. New arms build-ups take place that seem out of proportion to any threats by terrorist actors or rogue states. My message to you tonight is that the US and other nuclear weapon states should take initiatives to revive disarmament belatedly and, and achieve a stepwise exit from the nuclear weapons era. Let me begin, however, with an optimistic perspective and a note that over time the areas of peace in the world have been expanding. The areas of peace have been expanding. The wars between Nordic states, is, a war is inconceivable since a very long time. And wars between members of the European Union is also unthinkable today. More and more people who live in Europe also doubt the risk of a war between the European Union and Russia, even though relations have soured somewhat. In the European Union countries, many soldiers are now trained for UN-authorized peacekeeping operations, rather than for territorial defense, on which there is much less of an emphasis today. And looking outside Europe, we find that a war between the United States and Mexico is unthinkable today, although you had them in the past. And similarly, in Latin America, there were wars between states in the past, and I think no one would expect such a war would happen today. There were only 20 years between the World War I and World War II, but we have had more than 60 years without wars between major powers since World War II end. One is almost tempted to speak about a globalization of peace, and there are many reasons why wars have disappeared. In the past, differences about borders and territory or ideology and religion often led to war, and as you remember, in the Greek part of our history, there are even wars about women. But wars about borders, territory, ideology was common. And although conflicts about borders and territory still arise, not least in Africa, and sometimes lead to armed conflicts, such conflicts are now a thing of the past in large areas of the world. And so is colonialist occupation. Colonial use of force to keep colonies is, is out and the colonies have been emancipated and are members of the UN. As to borders, you remember that there were wars between Russia and China over the river Amur. There is no such friction today. In Europe, during the whole Cold War, the Oder-Neisse line, the river, was a line between the east and the west. Today, the Oder-Neisse is an internal waterway in the European Union. There are still, of course, civil wars. There are limited and regional wars and flashpoints like Kashmir or, Ta or Taiwan. 
and they may lead to horrible hope and bloody uh, conflicts. Let's hope they won't, but they might. But they are not likely to develop into global conflagrations. Issues of substance that cause frictions between great powers today are about such things as exchange rates, dumping prices, and perhaps pollution and carbon dioxide emissions. And you do not go to war on such issues. Tensions also exist and may stiffen about access to oil and gas. But it would seem more likely, I think, that such competition will play out in prices rather than in bullets. The long ideological battle of the Cold War ended nearly 20 years ago and was replaced by pragmatism. The world expected cooperation between the former adversaries. They expected disarmament and what we talk, called the peace dividend. Well, a good deal of that cooperation did in fact develop and a good deal of arms control and disarmament was achieved shortly after the end of the Cold War. Most striking, of course, was the authorization given in 1991 by the UN Security Council to the coalition of states led by the United States President Bush the Elder to liberate Kuwait from Iraq's occupation and aggression. The action was not blocked by any veto, and President Bush proudly talked about the action as a new international order. This was in the beginning of the 90s. In 1991, President Bush and President Gorbachev issued unilateral declarations about the withdrawal of tactical nuclear weapons from a great many places where they had been located, on ships, etc. That was 91. In 93, the Convention Against Chemical Weapons was concluded after some 20 years of negotiations in Geneva. This was also a fruit of the detente at the end of the Cold War. And in 1995, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was extended without any final date. And I'll talk more about that treaty in a little while. In 96, a treaty comprehensively prohibiting all nuclear weapons tests was adopted, not yet in force. And I'll come back to that too. And from a Cold War peak of some 55,000 nuclear weapons, the number of nuclear warheads has gone down to some 27,000 today in the world. So these were results of the detente and the end of the Cold War. However, we must, must wake up and to face a second inconvenient truth. Al Gore has told us about one inconvenient truth about the global warming. But there is at least another inconvenient truth. And that is that from the second half of the 1990s, the outlook for peace has come to look much less rosy than it was in the beginning. With the end of the Cold War, the pressure for, of, of public opinion to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons dwindled. It was strong in the 80s, and people were marching in the streets. But after the end of the Cold War, the pressure of public opinion relented. The comprehensive test ban treaty that I mentioned, and that was signed by the Clinton administration in 96, was rejected by the US Senate. And negotiations, negotiations about arms control and disarmament stagnated. And after 9-11-2001, there is concern about the threat of further terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. In 2002, the United States accused North Korea of embarking on a program of enrichment of uranium and stopped deliveries of heavy oil. Now that led North Korea to withdraw from the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to expel IAEA inspectors, to resume the production of plutonium, and later off to set off a nuclear explosion. In 2003, the armed intervention began in Iraq. A year ago, Kofi Annan rightly noted that the world was sleepwalking into new arms races. And by now, the build-ups can easily be seen. And let me mention some. The UK decided in the past year on a continuation of the nuclear Trident submarine program. The US administration proposes to develop a new standard nuclear weapon and it's further developing its missile shield by placing elements of it in Poland and the Czech Republic, claiming a need to defend against missiles that might be sent from Iran sometime in the future. China is modernizing its armed forces and has shot down a weather satellite of its own, demonstrating thereby a capability for military action in space. 
Russia made it clear only a few days ago that if the US were to go ahead placing arms in space, others would follow. Russia has further resumed routine long distance flights with nuclear armed planes and is suspending its adherence to the agreement on conventional forces in Europe. Iran is developing a uranium enrichment capability that could be used to produce materials for nuclear weapons. And the US has sent three aircraft carriers to the Persian Gulf. World military expenses amounted in 2006 to about $1.3 trillion, about which half is paid by you as taxpayers in the United States. More generally, there has been a troubling souring of relations between the big powers, and let me illustrate that as well. The United States has been used after the Second World War to regard itself as the master of the Pacific and is now showing concern about China's modernizing her navy. China is reported to build a naval base in Burma, and the U.S. is reported to strengthen very much its military base in Guam. This is a cold peace in the Pacific. The U.S. is seeking a nuclear cooperation agreement with India, though today it's uncertain whether it will actually come through, but they're seeking that cooperation with India. And in my view, it should be welcomed that India could import the most modern nuclear technology and use it for efficient carbon dioxide-free electricity generation. However, standing alone, the nuclear agreement could also facilitate for India to make more enriched uranium that could be used in nuclear weapons, to make more nuclear weapons. I'm not saying they would, but they could. Now this could lead China and Pakistan to do the same, and a nuclear race could result in Asia. That's a cold peace in Asia. Further, even though India will want to retain good relations with China and independence and freedom for its foreign policy, Many see in the U.S. initiative for a nuclear cooperation agreement an effort to bring in into a India into a chain of states that, if need be, could contain China. Australia, Japan, and South Korea would be other parts of such a link. How willing these states would be to serve in a chain, that's another matter. Now, these measures, they look like traditional balance of power politics, and so do the efforts I think, to further expand NATO in a similar way. That Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary, as well as the Baltic states, wished to join NATO was understandable. They were in reality occupied by the Soviet Union. However, it could hardly have been expected that the Russians, having recently given up or lost their empire, would welcome North Atlantic Treaty naval exercises in the Black Sea or to see Soviet former republics, Ukraine or Georgia, join the alliance. Even less will the Russian public opinion appreciate an idea voiced by their respectable Senator Luger last year that the doors of NATO should be open also to Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. I'm afraid that peace with Russia is also getting cold. The fear one might have is that traditional balance of power measures vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia will get traditional responses, and that new tensions will grow between a militarily supreme the United States and an economically and militarily increasingly powerful China and Russia, perhaps tied with some other states in a more developed Shanghai group. I'm not suggesting that tensions are problematic yet. Rather, I'm enough optimistic, some of you might say naive, to think that the accelerating interdependence of states will continue to force us, big and small, into cooperation. China sits on more U.S. government bonds than anyone else in the world, but its economic health and expansion is much dependent upon world markets. Europe needs energy from Russia, but Russia needs investments and equipment from Europe and from the rest of the world. Accelerating economic relations were calculated to bind the European states together in an unbreakable peace. This was the great idea of Jean Monnet. And it seems likely that such relations will have similar effects in other areas of the world. The arms races that now are taking place 
do not seem to be in line with the historical trend, and one wonders whether they can last in the absence of differences on significant issues of substance. And I'm not suggesting that issues about exchange rates or pollution is, are such issues, sufficiently big issues. Nonetheless, these arms races are profoundly worrisome. Arms races are self-propagating, and they may in themselves create greater risks than the threats they are supposed to meet. It seems to me also that some threats that are invoked today to justify more arms have been hyped. The exaggeration of threats may perhaps be good for domestic politics and for military industrial complex, but it's not good for the world. Painting China as a potential threat is good for arms sales, and the same applies to India. And saying that 9-11 was the Pearl Harbor of World War III or that we must prepare for war against the terrorism lasting generations may perhaps also win some votes and help the arms industry, but it doesn't help peace. Now, I hope you won't misunderstand me. I'm not a pacifist. I'm simply suggesting that a very serious and risky Cold War is over and that it would be tragic to start a new one or new ones. Military defense should stand in some proportion to the real threats. And the $1.3 trillion that we were spent by the world on military activities and hardware in 2006 are, in my view, excessive. Could we not spend half of it defending against the threats to our common environment? Could not half of the skilled scientists, many of them here in Seattle, who now devote themselves to national defense, be employed instead to defend the Earth? Now let me turn more specifically to the continued and renewed threats of the weapons of mass destruction. What does this term, this rather synthetic or term, WMD, weapons of mass destruction, stand for? Before I get into the serious and somber issue, let me start the discussion on a more uh, frivolous note. Now, I had uh, last autumn a, an email from a lady in Canada and she said that she wanted to name her cat after me. <laughs> she wanted to call it Blix. Did I have any objection? <laughs> so I mailed back and said that my wife and I, we love cats, and, and we felt very honored by this, but I just wanted to know that the cat accepted it. So another week passed, and then I had a new mail, and she said that, yes, the cat seems to be very content with the name, and now works beautifully as a weapon of mice destruction. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that the, the real weapons of mass destruction, they are man-made, and they are more serious. They are the nuclear, biological, and chemical, radiological, and the means of delivering them. Conventions have been concluded comprehensively prohibiting the production, stocking, and use of biological and chemical weapons. The risk that such weapons could be used by states or non-state actors is not zero, but I shall nevertheless limit my discussion to the nuclear weapons that are by far the most important. During the Cold War, both the Soviet Union and the United States thought that a further spread of nuclear weapons beyond the five states that had them would be dangerous and destabilizing, and others agreed. And the Non-Proliferation Treaty was concluded in 1968 and entered into force in 1970. It was confirmed and prolonged without any final date in 1995. So theoretically, it runs forever. Now, under that treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the non-nuclear weapon states' parties committed themselves not to acquire nuclear weapons, but they demanded and they achieved that the then five nuclear weapon states committed themselves to negotiate towards nuclear disarmament. They already had the nuclear weapons, so they could not promise to be without them, but they could at least promise to negotiate towards nuclear disarmament, and this they did. Now, in several respects, this treaty has been a great success. Almost all non-nuclear weapon states in the world have adhered to the treaty, and it's a special value that the Ukraine and Belarus and Kazakhstan, which all the three had nuclear weapons on their territories, joined the treaty and transferred their weapons to Russia. And a great deal of credit for this went both to the United States and to, the, to Russia. And I think today we would rather feel rather 
relieved that the Belarusians do not have any nuclear weapons on their territory because the regime that they have is not one that is ex exactly lenient or, or, uh, or democratic, certainly. Now, another great positive result of this treaty, in this treaty is that South Africa dismantled its nuclear weapons and joined the NPT. They had nuclear weapons, and they decided to get rid of them, dismantle them, and the IA, for which I was then the head, we inspected and verified this in very thorough in investigations. So they dismantled. They walked, the only country so far that walked back from being a nuclear weapon state. In some respects, however, there have been failures in the treaty. North Korea, Iraq, and Libya were parties as non-nuclear weapon states and violated the treaty. The three states never adhered to the treaty. That was India, Israel, and Pakistan. And they all developed nuclear weapons. Not then in violation, they were not bound, but they developed nuclear weapons. Another serious failure is that since a number of years, the five nuclear weapon states do not seem to take their commitment to negotiate towards nuclear disarmament seriously. Instead of timetables for phasing out nuclear weapons, timetables are made for new generations of such weapons to come into being. I'm not forgetting that the number of nuclear weapons have gone down in the world from some 55,000, as I mentioned, to 27,000. That's one thing that is good. But all the treaties that have not come into force, like the, con the Comprehensive Test Ban, etc., these are, are things that have been deadlocked. Today, Iraq and Libya, which violated the treaty, are back in the fold, and attention is focused on talks that currently look hopeful with North Korea and talks which look less successful so far with Iran, that, despite claims to the contrary, is suspected by several states to have the intention to abandon its commitment to non-proliferation. Now, which are the means open to the world and to the United States to persuade countries to join the NPT and to dissuade states parties from breaching their NPT obligations. Clearly, the world has given up on the three states that did not join, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Strong security-related reasons led them to develop nuclear weapons, and their minds are not changed by the embargo that nuclear supply states placed on nuclear exports to them and which the United States would remove if it enters into this agreement with India that I mentioned. That MR embargo may be lifted vis-a-vis -vis India. It is unlikely that any one of these states will, like South Africa, abandon its nuclear weapons, except in the context of agreements under which all nuclear weapon states in the world move to disarmament. India has said as much. They have said that if others are willing to forego their nuclear weapons, we are also willing to do so. That's a good argument for an agreement to stepwise leave the nuclear weapons era. The important questions of policy and principle are linked to the handling of three other cases of Iraq, North Korea, and Iran. First, North Korea. It is striking that no military threats have been used to bring North Korea to abandon its nuclear program. Such threats may well have been regarded as counterproductive vis-a-vis -vis nuclear and possibly leading North Korea to a hard line. The sticks used versus North Korea are rather isolation and absence of help than any military threats. And although there have been and surely remain many stumbling blocks, the sixth power format of the talks in Beijing has been helpful and the outlooks, outlook seems today relatively hopeful. Rather than sticks, they have had a number of carrots held out in front of North Korea. And one is that if North Korea goes along with disabling their nuclear installations, then economic assistance of various kinds would be given. North Korea would also be guaranteed against any armed attacks from the outside or subversion, subversion regime change inside, from, at any rate, instigated from the outside. And they're offered, offered, also offered that North Korea would be, be given a normalization of relations with the U.S. and Japan. In, pra in practical terms, this means diplomatic relations. If they were willing to make an agreement uh, disabling their nuclear installations, they it would be open for them to have diplomatic relations with the U.S. and Japan. And lastly, the 
could be foreseen that neither North Korea nor South Korea will have any installations for the enrichment of uranium and production of plutonium. This will be important because they do not have confidence in each other, and if either of them has enrichment or, re or reprocessing, and North Korea has had their reprocessing, their bombs have been plutonium bombs, then the others would not trust them, and therefore foreseen as a part of an agreement would be that neither would have any of these means of making bomb-grade material. Now let me turn to Iraq. When the IAA went for its first inspection in Iraq after the Gulf War in the spring of 1991, the Iraqi efforts to enrich uranium were discovered. On the very first inspection, gradually the weapons program was charted and understood by us. Nuclear installations and equipment that had not been destroyed by the bombs during the war or by Iraq itself were destroyed or removed under IA inspection. It was agreed among governments, including the US government, that nothing of nuclear relevance remained when the inspections ended in 1998. After 9-11, however, the, a reassessment of the evidence began in Washington. And by the autumn of 2002, it was asserted that Iraq was pursuing a nuclear weapons program. The suspicions that Iraq had or developed weapons of mass destruction drew some nourishment from the fact that during the 1990s, Iraq had often blocked international inspectors from entering sites and delayed the inspections. And you remember the talk about the Iraqis playing cat and mouse with inspectors. It is not, still not clear why the Iraq stopped the UN inspectors in the 1990s when there were, in fact, no weapons of mass destruction. Iraq really was a case of how the UN and the world could succeed in disarmament without really knowing it. Maybe Saddam Hussein wanted to fool his neighbors or his own people that he might still have some such weapons. Maybe he was like someone hanging a sign on his door saying, beware of the dog without having a dog. <laughs> there may be other speculations about it, but it's still the fact that they stopped the inspectors so frequently during the 90s gave rise to the suspicion that they had something to hide. What is clear, now if this is unclear, what is clear on the other hand, that in the fall of 2002, the US administration asserted the freedom to use military force unilaterally and without UN authorization to intervene in Iraq. At that time, a US strategy was made public, asserting such a freedom to take military action unilaterally, and it was stated, and I quote, that it would make the world not just safer, but better. Now that action was taken in Iraq and has had and continues to have tragic consequences. It also raises questions of law and principle. And one of these questions relates to the UN Charter. In a momentous step in San Francisco, the authors of the Charter prohibited members to use or threaten the use of force against each other and made only two exceptions from that ban. First, when it, when it determines the Security Council determines that there is a threat to the peace or breach of the peace, it can decide on or authorize the use of armed force. And the second exception was that when a state is subject to an armed attack, it can use its inherent right of self-defense. And that right of self-defense is also generally held to, to, to exist to repel imminent armed attacks, but certainly not to authorize preventive wars. The invasion in Iraq in March 2003 was neither authorized by the Security Council, nor was it in self-defense of the United States or the UK or any of the other states participating. I cannot help but wondering whether the authors of the 2002 US strategy allowing preventive war strategy thought, whether they thought that other states would have the same freedom and whether this too would make the world safer and better. A difficulty with the doctrine allowing preventive war is that it is hard to prove the danger of an armed attack that has not started. The action must necessarily build on intelligence. And considering how intelligence has worked and been used, one can be worried. The intelligence, as we know, has been not only faith-based, but also fake-based. 
And when we know how much spin and hype and disinformation there is in the world, one wonders where this would take us if preventive wars would be allowed to start simply on intelligence. You're all familiar with the saying of President Lincoln that you can fool some pe all of the people sometime and some people all of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. But I'm told that the spin doctors in various capitals nowadays say that this is much too pessimistic a view. Now, this may be a moment to comment on the inspections in Iraq for which I was responsible. In the course of three and a half months, UNMUVIC carried out some 700 inspections in about 500 different sites. And we reported that we found no weapons of mass destruction, only some debris from past programs. Most significant was that we went to some three dozen sites offered to us by national intelligence. We asked them, please, you are saying that Iraq retains weapons of mass destruction. You must have some idea where they are. Tell us. And we were given a number of sites, and we went, had time before the war to go to about three dozens of those sites. And only in the few cases did we find anything at all. And it did not relate to weapons of mass destruction. And as we reported on them, and to, to, the, to the intelligence agencies, and to the world, they should have concluded that the sources they had, in many cases, defectors, were not reliable. The defectors wanted invasion, they didn't want inspection. And we were told that the sites given to us were the best. And when we heard that, we wondered if these were the best, what was the rest? Now, had verification continued for a few months more, we would have been able to go to all the sites suspected by intelligence. And as there were new weapons of mass destruction, the inspectors and the council would have learned that and it would have been start harder, harder to start the war. The UN inspection unit that I led saw itself as international civil servants who sought to the best of their ability to fulfill the task that the Security Council had laid upon them and to inspect professionally and report their findings correctly. We did not claim to be smarter than government agents, but I could sincerely say at any rate that we were in nobody's pocket. I've been told, and it's been stated, that I was bugged during this period. If it is true, I have no evidence. I simply wish they had listened a little more carefully to what I had to say. <laughs> now, four years after the war, I see the armed intervention as a tragedy, and also as a sad breaking of a global development towards detente and a ban on the use of armed force. Now, first, the tragedy. The invasion failed the aims that it had declared. No weapons of mass destruction could be eliminated because they did not exist. Al-Qaeda could not be eradicated because it was not in Iraq. However, through the invasion, Iraq became a fertile ground for Al-Qaeda and for terrorism. Democracy has not emerged. So far, we have seen chiefly anarchy. One success is to be recorded, and that is that Saddam Hussein was ousted, and he was a bloody dictator, and it was good to have him ousted. A valuable experience is also to be recorded, and that is that professional international inspection gave accurate and unbiased information. I'm not against national intelligence. I think it's necessary in times of, of terrorism, but I think the governments of the coalition were unwise to ignore our reports and rely only on their own intelligence. Maybe they felt that an operation that only cost them about $100 million, that it couldn't that possibly have any value compared to their own operations that are in the cost of billions of dollars. I think in the future the world may have a need for more monitoring, independent of national in, in agencies. Perhaps not only about weapons of mass destruction. We may need international independent monitoring, perhaps about the emissions of carbon dioxide or other fishing, international fishing, more monitoring of that. So it's not limited simply to weapons of mass destruction. In 2003, there was more than ignoring the UN inspections. There was also a disdain or contempt for the United Nations. When the Security Council did not authorize the armed intervention in March 2003, it was criticized as being impotent. Today, I think many people would rather say that the Council showed wisdom 
when it refused to authorize an armed action that was inconsistent with the Charter and that led to a war that should never have taken place. Today, the Bush administration is not showing an ideologically hostile attitude to the UN. It seeks to make use of the organization in several fields, not least in the case of Iraq, and I think that's wise. Yet, negative attitudes to the United Nations is evidently still seen as a political plank for some. Mr. Giuliani, who did a great job as a mayor of New York, and I praise him for that, he is now one of the candidates for the U.S. President, and I read in the Foreign Affairs, he wrote recently, and I quote him, that we need to look realistically at America's relationship with the United Nations. The organization can be useful for some humanitarian and peacekeeping functions, but we should not expect much more of it. I think we should. Now, is this, you may ask, a climate for disarmament and peace? Despite the gloomy past decade, there are a few positive signs. After Iraq, I think there is a growing understanding that military power and pressures may not be helpful to achieve a change, achieve a change or secure non-proliferation. The Bush administration is showing greater interest in diplomacy, for instance in the case of North Korea, and greater interest in using the United Nations. A year ago, an independent international commission that I chaired, and Kessler mentioned a moment ago, and was financed chiefly by the Swedish government, presented a report on disarmament called Title Title, Weapons of Terror, Freeing the World of Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Weapons. The commission advocates a revival of disarmament and a fulfillment of the pledges that were made in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It submits in particular that some 20 years after the end of the Cold War, it is high time that the five nuclear weapon states take seriously their commitment to negotiate towards nuclear disarmament. It would have a dramatic impact on the world political climate and reduce incentives to proliferation. Some steps could be taken without further delay. The US Senate could reconsider its rejection of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. No other measure could send a stronger signal in the international community that disarmament is moved back on the global agenda and entry into force of the treaty would impede the development of nuclear weapons, not least in non-nuclear weapon states. Second, the US and Russia, who have the largest stocks of nuclear weapons, could take the initiative to a reduction, not just redeployment of nuclear weapons. Talks could, could also start to ensure that no weapons at all be placed in space. The Outer Space Treaty prohibits already now the placing of any weapons of mass destruction in space, but it doesn't explicitly prohibit the placing of other weapons in space. And it is somewhat perverse that in regarding space, we have an army, one army of engineers who are helping us to devise new techniques of making use of this asset that belongs to the world, that is space. And then you have another army of engineers who are thinking very diligently, how can we shoot the whole thing to pieces and make the outer space a junkyard? And at the, also perverse that there have been resistance to discussing this question for years in the Geneva Conference of Disarmament. Another proposal, another thing that could be done would be to take nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert, where they are. Lots of nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert today, which gives very little time for a decision to, to launch them. And it does entail risk of accident and misunderstandings. Further, nuclear weapons could be removed from Western Europe and Western Russia. It is a remnant, a relic of the Cold War that you have NATO nuclear weapons in Western Europe. And the Russians have tactical or non-strategic nuclear weapons not so far from Western Europe. And they could both be removed. It would be a good balance to the controversy that we have now about the placing of parts of the missile link in Poland and the Czech Republic. Now that there could also be better controls of radioactive and fissionable material to strengthen to, and make it harder for any terrorist to acquire such material if they try. What then are the prospects for nuclear disarmament? Mixed so far. An encouraging sign is that early this year, a group of US elder statesmen, former Secretary of State Schultz and Kissinger, and former Secretary of Defense Perry, whose 80th anniversary occurred yesterday, and I was happy to be with him in Stanford, 
and the fourth man was Senator Nunn. They published early this year in Wall Street Journal an article with the title, Nuclear Madness. They urged these, these, old, these men from the Cold War, they urged the US to take the lead in an initiative with other nuclear weapon states in order stepwise to get to nuclear disarmament. No one saying expects it to happen overnight, but stepwise reduction seems possible. During the Cold War, they say, nuclear weapons were necessary for deterrent. Today, it is not needed, they say, between the big powers, and the continued arsenals may be an incentive for others, including terrorists, to acquire nuclear weapons. I note further as helpful that the talks with North Korea have come to be pursued with greater flexibility, which is much more likely to get results. Regrettably, we do not yet see any similar posture vis-a-vis -vis Iran where the threats are loud. Now let me conclude. The commission that I headed stressed that when we want to convince states to stay away from or do away with nuclear weapons, the best approach is one which makes the states feel that they do not need nuclear weapons for their security. Now hearing big powers talk about the development of new nuclear weapons or about all options being on the table does not create such feelings. Cooperative foreign security and economic policies are required, not arms built up. With accelerating interdependence, there is anyway an increasing necessity to, to cooperate, to protect the global environment, to manage the global economy, and to stop contagious diseases like SARS and HIV, avian flu, why not then also cooperate to stop threatening each other? The window of opportunity that opened at the end of the Cold War has been allowed to hang flapping in the wind, and it's high time that it be fully opened and lead to cooperative security order. And the UN must play a central role in this order. As my countryman, Mr. Hamaschel, once said, the UN will not take us to heaven, but it might help us to avoid hell. Thank <laughs> you.